Brianna Wu's online and career history is a tangled mess of dramas, deleted posts, impossible to verify claims, and outright lies. Much of this research has relied on the internet archive, as it seems there has been a concerted effort to hide evidence. Regardless, I want to try to deep dive into Brianna Wu's claim credentials, life experience, some contested details of her activity in Gamergate, and finally, her political career. To provide context for what we're seeing now, she re-enters this side of the internet. Obviously, anyone who knows anything about Wu will be aware that a lot of the info about Wu requires some dead naming and light transvestigation to fully prove. I will be trying to respect Wu's attempt to leave her pre-transition identity behind in this video and omit mentions of her dead name. However, should details of this video be seriously questioned, I may provide a supplementary update video or document that more concretely links pieces of information to Wu. Wu's credentials are a mess to investigate. She has made numerous contradictory claims. So I'll just start by running down a few claims and then provide the facts once we've established the statements she's made. As early as 2009, Wu made IGM posts claiming to have a degree seemingly as a way to boost credibility of her opinions about a variety of topics. From the psychology of processing information to copyright law in 2011, Wu made a post claiming to have a double major in journalism and political science. Additionally, a Boston Globe interview also claimed that she was a graduate of the University of Mississippi, though her major is not specified. At one point, this was even listed in her Wikipedia page. However, it has since been corrected to better reflect the truth. This truth was revealed during her public spats with disgraced journalist Milo Yiannopoulos. He ran a check on Wu's education, and when he released the result, people found out that Wu had been lying to the public about her degree in investigative journalism, political science, and whatever other degrees she's alluded to. The reality of the situation was that Brianna Wu attended university for 10 years, yet never graduated. Milo's reporting on Wu will become briefly relevant again later. In 2014, Wu made a series of claims about her parents and upbringing. I specifically want to zero in on this one set of tweets because they follow a common theme, outlandish, extravagant ambitions that become catastrophic failures. Wu states that at age 20, she was given $200,000 by her parents start an animation business. This studio was called Socially Unconscious Productions, named after Wu's late 90s university newspaper comic strip, which the animation studio was founded to produce an adaptation of. Just to add weight to the idea, this is in fact Wu's comic strip, as it was produced under a different name. You will notice striking similarities between the comic strip and Brianna Wu's game, Revolution 60. The story of this comic strip and animation studio, the wild and modelled ride. There are even claims of a restraining order against Wu as a result of a racist tirade in response to her having a comic rejected, made by a Mississippi student who reported being part of the same student newspaper. I mainly want to focus on Wu's outright lies in the resume she published online. Now it's obviously no crime to talk yourself up on a resume, however Wu took things a step further with outright falsehoods which helped to further establish a pattern of lying to bolster her credibility. First, Wu claims that the comic strip was syndicated to other newspapers, but no record of this could ever be found. Second, Wu claims to have patented new animation techniques for the socially unconscious movie, which again could not be verified. Wu also claimed a comic strip was published in the Laugh Factory magazine, which featured articles from some of the greatest comedians of all time, such as Eddie Murphy and Larry David. Unsurprisingly, this also could not be verified. In fact, the latest records of the Laugh Factory magazine that I could find were dated in the mid-90s, implying that it may not even be possible for Wu's claims of her strip being published in 2001 to be true. More recently, Wu has claimed a new title, which is that of a cybersecurity expert. To survive, I had to believe in myself. I didn't come back on my own. I had a lot of help. Eventually, I became a software engineer and cybersecurity expert. Obviously, she has no real educational training in this. There's no job role listed in her LinkedIn page that might corroborate this, nor have I seen it mentioned anywhere else. Understanding Wu's place in the Gamergate controversy of 2014 is key to understanding Wu as a person. Wu has a history of lying to drum up attention, making grandiose promises she cannot fulfill, and abusing whatever power she can obtain through connections or money for her own self-interest, regardless of who it hurts. I'll go over some of the highest profile dramas Wu chose to be a part of around this time to establish this pattern of behaviour. 
Wu first began inserting herself into the controversy when she claimed on a podcast she was receiving harassment. This was on the 8th of September 2014 and seems to give no inciting incident or evidence of these claims. I had an hour long discussion today with Amanda at Giant Space Cab because we don't know, we don't want to be the victim of this. This week I have had so much harassment on my Twitter. It has been blocking 50 to 100 people a day, just constantly. This is strange as, and you will see this as I go on here, that Wu does not miss an opportunity to signal boost the people making threats to her. It also contradicts her interview in the Boston Globe, which claims that the harassment started on October 9th after she made a joke tweet, which tweet this was is unspecified. Subsequently, Wu announced a parody account of Mock 4chan users with brolols. Regardless of your take on how widespread harassment during Gamergate was, which according to Brandwatch, a social media analytics company, was a vast minority, with only somewhere between 4 and 10% of tweets at Gamergate's so-called targets being of even negative sentiment, let alone harassing in nature. It is undeniable that Wu injected herself into the conversation apropos of nothing. In fact, one of the biggest memes about Brianna Wu at the time was literally Wu because nobody seemed to know who she was or where she came from. Despite this, let's take a look at some of Brianna Wu's biggest moments of controversy during the Gamergate saga. The late John Bain, better known by his username Total Biscuit, was a highly popular and respected PC gaming critic and podcaster. He made a constant stand for consumers in gaming, taking a principled opposition to practices such as pre-orders, microtransactions and loot boxes being one of the first to sound the alarms about the introduction of many of these strategies. Naturally, he also took issue with some of the practices and games journalism that he saw as unethical. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Turtle Biscuit. The last few weeks has been turbulent, there's no doubt about that, and many, many people have got hurt in, unfortunately, what appears to be a necessary discussion on the role of games media and, more to the point, the ethics of games media in 2014. The harassment that's been going on is deplorable. The death threats, some of which I've received myself, flying left and right. The actions of psychopathic individuals. It's disgusting. There's no question about that. However, it's also a giant distraction. These few psychopaths are not the real issue at play. The interesting part about this, in relation to Gamergate, is that he did not focus on the more questionable critiques of female developers sleeping with journalists. Though, he did acknowledge Zoe Quinn's alleged relationships with journalists at outlets such as Kotaku was the spark that lit the fire. You've got to bear in mind that the same websites that were reporting a fairly one-sided view of what Gamergate was, it's not that they were lying necessarily, but they were telling only part of the truth, were also implicated in uh, ethical scandals that were brought up during the whole thing. Now, uh, Kotaku, which is uh, one of the sites that wrote quite a lot about Gamergate and certainly sided against it, were actually the cause of the whole thing if you were to go back to the original incident which sparked it off which was uh, a, an indie developer who was accused of essentially having a nepotistic relationship with a journalist and really it was more about at least in my eyes the journalist allowing that to happen you know i think it's in a developer's best interest to get good press any way you possibly can if you decide that being friends or even engaging in a romantic fling with a journalist is a way to get positive press that's your prerogative uh, and, and you, you as a, as a developer, have no ethical requirement on you at that point. But the journalist does. You know, the journalist at that point should be recusing themselves. TB was more concerned with activities such as the whining and dining of journalists at big corporate events, the awarding of free merchandise, undeclared sponsorships, and potential blacklisting of certain outlets from receiving review codes of games as a result of negative scores. As a result of Total Biscuit's outspoken nature on these issues, he became a target for the small minority of harassers on the other side of the issue, the self-professed social justice advocates who would send death and rape threats to his wife. And I checked Twitter about an hour into my chemo session, and my feed was full of death threats, for the most part. Um, a lot of people, especially uh, who knew about my condition, because it was quite public, you know, saying that I hope cancer gets you quickly, and other people saying, you know, I will, I will come and kill you. I will rape your wife. I will kill your child, etc., etc. I, mean, I counted well over a hundred instances in the course of an hour from a hundred different people of people saying pretty horrible things. This was not helped by Brianna Wu, who took it upon herself to frame TB as a misogynistic, transphobic, 
leader of harassment, surely pouring fuel on the fire that raged against him amidst his cancer diagnosis. Um, you know, Total Biscuit is someone who's very popular in this realm. He's, you know, as transphobic and sexist and horrible as someone can be. And he has a massive audience. So there's just no awareness that this is important. This was always a ridiculous allegation, as even at the time, Total Biscuit made his support for women and ethnic minorities in the industry well known. Co-hosting a podcast with one of the biggest named women in gaming at the time, known as Dodger, which featured a variety of female guests, such as Alana Pierce of IGN and Felicia Day. It is disproportionate. Yes, it's a male-dominated industry, and I certainly hope for that to change, and it is changing. Year on year, we're getting more and more women being involved in this industry, and that's fantastic because it's a creative industry, and we need as many minorities involved as possible because that that's what makes interesting stories, right? Further disproving Wu's allegations here, the third host of said podcast, Jesse Cox, ran a convention called CoxCon, where TB would appear for each year he was around for. In 2017, an attendee at the convention asked the well-known internet meme debate question, are traps gay? Yo, in the back. What up, dude? So, uh, me and a couple of friends were having a um, uh, discussion about this at the bar last night. Are traps gay? Once this occurred, Total Biscuit was made aware that transgender guests at the show were made uncomfortable, and as such, made a tweet condemning the question as transphobic and asking for details on who asked it, before promptly having the guest removed from the event. Total Biscuit would go on to defend this action, despite immense backlash from different corners of the internet which he would discuss the next year on his H3 podcast appearance. And our staff notices we have uh, quite a few transgender guests that come like they've been coming since year one. You know, regular people, they just come to the convention to have a couple of days of no bullshit. Mm -hmm. you know, to have a nice friendly time with a group of people that hopefully are all very supportive and sure. generally Absolutely. nice people, right? And the staff see there's a lot of noticeably uncomfortable faces like there's a girl who's really upset, she's crying, sucks. And the staff makes the decision, like, what we're going to do about this, like, we don't know what you know why this guy said this is he here to troll the event like is he here just to mess it up for people is he here to actually upset people or is he just like a giant cringe lord? what we'd heard about uh, one of the staff had actually overheard this guy at a bar and apparently heard him talking to his friends about his plan to sort of say this mm. and this had come up later i'm like well you know we don't know for sure he may have just said that while he was drunk we don't know one way or the other, we have some people who are uncomfortable at the show, then they don't feel comfortable being here. We need to do something about it. We need to do something about it quick. Mm -hmm. And we need to do something about it in a way that the, everybody knows. So the best way we thought to do that was, well, the staff made the decision to get rid of them. And like, well, I can put it out on my Twitter. That's what we did. I announced it. Well, I saw your tweet. And I, I guess a lot of people were saying that you started a witch hunt for this guy. Yeah, that's nonsense. Like, we never released his name because, of sure. course, we would never do that. Yeah. Um, I don't even know what his name is. Right. I don't even know what it looks like. I had nothing to do with that. I had I, I found this comment by someone who I guess was offended by the way you reacted Longtime to Longtime fan it. of Total Biscuits up until the meltdown over the meme question at CoxCon. Why did he take the joke so seriously? It would have gone so much better for him if he just laughed it off and then made a seemingly unrelated comment about it later, assuming he felt that someone may have seen it as transphobic. Clearly, a huge amount of his fan base as well as casual observers think that was poorly handled at best. So just to reiterate, why get so up in arms over a joke? And then he says, anyway, no hostility meant, and he what is a, is a fan of yours. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess I'd ask him the same question. Why get so up in arms over <coughs> what we did? Right. Ultimately, it seems like none of the people who are actually at the show were upset about how we handled it. Right. Mm. Like, I know for a fact that people came to me and said that they were not upset, quite the opposite, that they right. were happy that it, that it had been handled that way. And it seems like when you know there's a 4chan brigade and you know there's a bunch of subreddits that are basically dedicated to trolling and you know that they've gone after you on purpose, mm. it's kind of hard to take comments like that sincerely. Despite all of this vindicating context, Wu continued her smearing of TB, even after his passing, claiming, The most impactful legacy of John Bain that I see is an army of toxic gamers who harass women they don't like in his name. This is a strange comment, given his repeated disavowal of harassment, and the fact that by any standard you could claim TB encouraged harassment, Wu would also meet that same standard. With her lies about him no doubt encouraging action taken against the family she professes to be so concerned about.
The most clear-cut, easily established example of Wu's self-victimization is when she posted a hate thread about herself calling for people to harass her, which was promptly deleted to the discussion page of her Steam Greenlight campaign for Revolution 60. This is probably a good time to cover Wu's game Revolution 60 as an attempt to promote this game in its Steam Greenlight campaign as well as cover up the fact that she was missing deadlines for its release is theorised to be the impetus for her attempts to drum up controversy and public attention during Gamergate. This is somewhat reinforced by the fact that she conveniently claims the first instances of harassment to have occurred while she was at PAX East promoting her game. The game started as an iOS release for the iPad. Wu has been quoted as describing it as Heavy Rain meets Mass Effect. I'll show you some gameplay and allow you to decide the truth. After the iOS release, Wu ran a Kickstarter campaign to fund the PC port which was successful in raising over $12,000. Despite being released around the time of a feminist reckoning in gaming, the character designs appear to be some of the most grotesquely sexualized, malformed, demonic entities ever modelled. Wu claims to this day that this was an amazing, groundbreaking game and claims that before abandoning her game development career, a studio, Giant Space Cat, was on the verge of expanding into VR and AR, comparing their projects to the holodeck from Star Trek. And we were in the middle of a huge expansion into VR and AR. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in some ways, Revolution 60 was my line in the dirt telling the industry to take me seriously. Like, look, I can deliver a quality game. Look at this, because we were working on some of the coolest Mass Effect technology you'll ever see, like stuff that really pushes this to the holodeck. In 2018, Wu also claims to have worked 80 hour weeks for years. Can I, can I get real with you about this? It was so hard for me to make this decision because I have worked 80 hour weeks since 2010, building up my game studio. Conflicting with an ex-contractor of the studio named Emma Clarkson, who alleges that Brianna Wu was incredibly lazy and lied about her after Emma terminated the contract. All of Giant Space Cat's social media has been silent since 2016, and nothing has been produced by the studio since the PC port of Revolution 60, which took over two years to complete after being funded via Kickstarter. From that day onward, my life was changed forever in ways that I could have never predicted by vicious trolls and fans alike from every corner of the online, crawling out of the woodworks, and I could never have predicted, okay? I could never have predicted, I didn't know that at that time I'd set off a chain reaction that would end up with me in the situation I am today. I had no idea during the course of my journey I would meet friends from across the world and I would accidentally become targeted by a sinister international conspiracy. I would become an asset of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. I would avert missile strikes from hitting my hometown, save thousands of lives. I would shoot my dad in The Sims 3. I would send my friend on an overseas counterterrorism mission. In the process of all of this, I would permanently injure my left leg, my big toe, my gastrointestinal system, my mental state, and my eternal soul! <sighs> And all of this sounds like something out of a movie, I know. And I am off my meds, I know. But bear with me here, because this happened. This is the truth of the situation, and the whole truth, and nothing but. And you can check the sources I will provide. You can go to my channel. You can go through my history, watch the videos, okay? And know that this is not one word of an exaggeration. This is the future. This is my life. This is Jay Stryker! <sighs> my life li might be a movie, and my life might think like a movie script, but this movie doesn't have a surprise ending, because the good guys win! 
and I may not be a good guy online, but I will win the online! No matter if my mom's a bitch, and no matter if you are a bitch to you trolls! So no! Know that you cannot cut me down online! Because history is written by the victor's mother, bitch! And guess what? This is history, and I am the victor! Which is also me online! Press one! Okay, that's sick! 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 Woo! Woo! Okay, okay, that's sick, bitch. One of the few credible and verifiable death threats against Wu during Gamergate occurred when a figure by the name of Jace Connors, or Parkour Dude 91, who fronted a small group of extremist gamers called Deagle Nation, declared the start of Operation Wu Pocalypse. This was a plan in which he intended to commit an act of violence against Wu, quote, Assassin's Creed style, which he stated in a video while he waved around a knife. Phase 2 of this plan see another Deagle Nation member. Eli hacked data from Tumblr servers in Canada, the trip he filmed himself packing for. See, a little extra there. Um, I'm um, bringing Skyrim. I mean, I know that doesn't really fit, but like, I figured going to Canada is basically just gonna be like Skyrim meets like fucking James Bond. So I'm bringing that. Um. Got some weapons here. Um, bringing this. I mean, like, I had to do, like, a concealed carry this time. So, I brought this thing. Because I'm going to be with my bitch dad. So, I'm bringing that. And... This gained further traction as Tice, the third and final Deagle Nation soldier, made a threatening video in which he wore a skull mask and detailed his part in the plan. So this is one of the 106 death threats that I've gotten this year. I'm going to play it for you. I'm going to tell you this is pretty shocking. This is the Skulls Manifesto where I'm going to be teaching you all. Well, not teaching you. I'm going to tell you about how me and my crew will fucking take care of the fucking women and gaming issue that you've all been hearing about on the gamer sites. We're going to deal with this vigilante style, basically. I've pretty much unchained the beast within. I'm gonna be go bloodthirsty on these fascists and like. This is for the manifesto for the skulls. We are an anarchist men's rights group called the Skulls, and this is our manifesto. We are fed up with the coffee bullshit and the media, and we're gonna take back the games industry from fags. Our high priest put a death omen on Brianna Wu's life, and we are gonna finish the fight. Uh, that's that's it guys. This is Tice Andrews, the official blade master of the skulls. That's it. Keep it fucking real and you'll see me in the news. Look for the skull mask. I'm gonna do this hitman style. This ended abruptly as Jace crashed his mother's Toyota Prius full of guns while on the way to enact this plan. This can be seen in the Sci-Fi Channel documentary, The Internet Ruined My Life where Wu describes it as the most terrifying thing she has ever seen. Bro, YouTube, this is Jace right here, and this is my fucking car, or my mom's car, that when I was straight racing, could not perform! Couldn't fucking perform on the road, and now the piss shit has crashed, okay? I can't even kick the windshield out because it's made of bullshit plastic from shanks and clothes. I wasn't even fucking drunk. I was just racing, you know, like normal. I was trying to street race in the fucking highway. And look at this bullshit. Look at this shit. Totally useless. I hit and I fucking rolled on the ice. Fucking rolled down here. And now look at this piece of shit. I'm a street racing guy. there is one caveat to this story, however, which is that almost none of this was true. This was an obvious troll. The knife appeared to be plastic, and Chase Connors was a comedian 
called Jan Rankowski, associated with the legendary Sam Hyde led outfit Million Dollar Extreme. He played the bit of a paranoid schizophrenic shut in gamer along with his friends. Some of the other plans and beliefs he discussed included a plan to rescue Tupac from Palestine, believing that US Army snipers smoke weed to stabilize their aim. Wanting to be a Marine in the future deserves the same respect as being a veteran, and that parkour is a martial art. We further used the Tice video in a talk she gave for Silicon Republic in 2015, playing a frankly absurd clip of the video, which has been almost completely scrubbed from the internet, in which Tice claims to be the official blade master of the Skulls, says that his high priest has put a death omen on Brianna Wu, calls her a fascist, and references the video game Hitman. It could be argued that despite this being an obvious troll to anyone with any sense, Wu genuinely believed herself to be in danger. However, as with many of her claims of harassment, she handled this in the worst way possible. As previously mentioned, Wu has a pattern of engaging with and signal boosting people she claims are threats to her life. This is the first thing you will be advised against doing, as it will only encourage the behavior. While this could be chalked up to stupidity, it's also perfectly reasonable to interpret that she did not actually believe these threats to be legitimate she felt safe in fanning the flames for further attention. This is exactly what happened, as Jace continued antagonizing Wu on Twitter while demanding that they have a street race to settle the score. Wu would bring up this saga numerous times, as mentioned before, however as recently as a couple of years ago, she would still misrepresent the issue further when promoting the seemingly failed Gamergate TV show she was working on. Despite it being known for years that this was a million dollar extreme trolling op, even being discussed in media articles at the time, Wu neglects to mention this and still simply claims that a man in a skull mask sent her videos. Again, not fully true, as they were public YouTube skits, and says that he threatened to murder her husband and dogs, which, again, cannot be verified as the full video is no longer available. However, what we do have of this video does not corroborate this. Like one of the most iconic uh, moments of Gamergate that they actually uh, put in the Law and Order episode was the man in the skull mask, like sending videos to me about how he was going to murder me, my husband, and my dog. You know, it's kind of just melodrama, right? Uh, just not something I want to revisit. It's not something that I thought would add to the discourse. Politics may be the only area that Wu has some verifiable, legitimate experience. In the early 2000s, Wu was able to get a job for a brief time under Republican Senator to Mississippi, Trent Lott, a well-known supporter of segregation, seemingly up to and including the time that Brianna worked for him. Quoted as saying, When Strom Thurmond ran for president, we voted for him. We're proud of it. And if the rest of the country had followed our lead, we wouldn't have had all these problems over the years either in 2002. Strom Thurmond's presidential bid did include calls to preserve racial segregation. Wu took a long break from politics to pursue education, game development, you know the rough story. After becoming more of an activist than anything else through Gamergate, Wu used this controversy to launch a 2018 congressional bid. Then, in 2014, I was targeted by the alt-right in a hate group known as Gamergate. They targeted women who were just asking to be treated fairly by the tech industry. And when I spoke out against them, they targeted me too, in ways that were so criminal, the FBI became involved. They told me that they would murder me, murder my husband, my pets. They did everything they could to silence me. This is somewhat significant, as Wu continually claims she wants to get away from that reputation. Also worth noting is the continued misrepresentation of what exactly happened, still citing the million dollar extreme trolling in an attempt to prove her point, including the video of Jace's overturned car as if he were genuinely on the way to carry out Operation Woopocalypse. Wu also still refers to Gamergate as a hate group, a claim she made in the Boston Globe's interview with her, which, as we covered earlier, is patently untrue, given only around 5-10% to of Gamergate's tweets had a negative sentiment, and it was in no way a real group or organization. It was a social media campaign and consumer advocacy movement. Whatever motivations you want to attribute to the people involved, genuine concern for consumers and journalistic standards, or misogyny, 
The characterization of Gamergate as a hate group, clearly a gross misrepresentation. Putting it in the same category as a group like the Proud Boys totally trivializes the danger actually posed by these real hate groups. Wu's presentation in this video of her being disowned and left to fend for herself, impoverished and desperate by her adoptive parents, is also slightly misleading from what we can tell. Wu was around 30 years old when she lost contact with her adoptive parents. The idea that you would struggle to fend for yourself or have a good enough job to stay out of poverty after being raised in massive privilege and given hundreds of thousands of dollars to fail at creating businesses repeatedly and fail to get a degree for 10 years is frankly absurd and speaks to Wu's total incompetence and proclivity to fail upwards. Regardless, Wu lost the Democratic primary in 2018 in a landslide victory by Stephen Lynch and suspended her 2020 run, never appearing on the ballot. Subsequently, her and Cenk Yuga of the Young Turks co-founded the Rebellion PAC in 2020 to run anti-Trump ads and encourage progressive voters. So, what has Rebellion PAC been involved in? Well, people who have been around my channel may have heard of it in another place, that being the Twitch channel of panel host Wick TV. This is notable as we made the decision to sponsor two Wick streams via Rebellion Pack. One being a debate panel on whether contraception is good or bad for society. Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of Wick TV, a cross ideological space where we come together to talk about issues from political to cultural, from the silly to the serious. Uh, today is our first sponsored stream. This debate series is brought to you by Rebellion Pack. Rebellion is a progressive pack led by Brianna Wu, focused on communication and strategic alliances across the political divide. Rebellion believes that we can't solve problems without talking to each other about them, and we strongly support the mission of WIC TV. And the other being a debate between leftist streamer Vosh and a smaller Catholic streamer called Bagel about abortion. Welcome to yet another episode of WIC TV a cross-ideological space where we come together to discuss issues both political and cultural, from the silly to the serious. Gang, we got a good one for you today. Uh, this debate series is the second in a two-part series sponsored by Rebellion Pack. President Sunday claims the cost of these sponsorships was somewhere around or just below $1,000. She spent, I don't know if I'm allowed to say how much, she spent a lot of money over... Over eight hundred dollars, let's say, on getting on getting Wick to host a debate between Vosh and Bagels, and it's like Wick would have done this for free. You may be wondering why these sponsorships are significant. Well, they appear to be a pretty clear violation of Twitch's terms of service, which disallow any paid promotion of a political figure, party, or debate. When confronted on this by Chad Logic, Wu attempted to reframe it as not actually being a sponsorship, despite the fact that Wick explicitly referred to it as a sponsorship in the titles of both streams. I've gotten some money. I've been working on uh, actually paying some streamers to do democratic organizing uh, behind the scenes, right? This is utterly routine. All kinds of people are paid for stuff. I believe streamers should be paid for organizing, right? I'm trying to bring some new revenue streams into the space. He's going after me. Uh, that one stop. Yeah, isn't that against ridiculous. the rules? Isn't that against, wait, no, no, isn't that against TOS? I don't think you could do political organizing on these platforms, can you? Yeah, of course you can. Why, why couldn't you? Oh, well, on Twitch. I, I don't understand. Um... I thought that there was rules about sponsorships that you couldn't take. Well, uh... it's not it's not sponsorship necessarily to, um, you know, like I don't go and say, hey, please make this video. Please do X. Please do Y. It's more like, um, you know, paying people to come like organize on issues to talk about the content that we think is effective to put that out, that kind of thing. Wu well, seems to have decided after this talk with Chad change of venue. Instead, it seems CounterPoints will be the new beneficiary of Rebellion Pack funding, as Wu has announced a left versus right panel show with him, assumedly hosted on YouTube instead this time. So, where are we now? Well, Rihanna Wu is starting to use her newfound connections in the Twitch politics sphere to run an image rehabilitation campaign 
and get away from a history of scandals and lies. It also seems that even Destiny will be teaming up with Rebellion Pack canvassing efforts in the next American general election. With rumours circulating, this will involve a united front between Destiny, Vosh and Kefels. Numerous streamers have allowed her on their platform to continue downplaying her lies and involvement in smearing others. Nobody seems to have bothered to familiarise themselves with her history. Erudite even decided to host an interview with her that's primary purpose seems to have been to make her more palatable to an audience of people who may have had the sense something was off about Wu, but did not have the requisite years of knowledge to quite put their finger on it. Hopefully, this video will provide a digestible and watchable record of some of the controversies and history Brianna Wu has been involved in. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Please like, comment, subscribe, buy a membership, or send a super thanks. And I'll catch you in the next one.